So apparently the discussion has gotten heated around discount rates, which, look, I love a good economics debate as much as the next finance nerd. But this one has gotten weird. And I don't just mean heated in the usual places like Reddit and the comment section. Jeff Brown says I went badly astray, and he cringed reading my article. Lawrence Kotlikoff says I made an Econ 101 error, and I seriously can't be serious. That's an actual quote, by the way. David Blanchett says my article was a travesty. Ouch, David. Ouch, David. And despite all that, I'm here to tell you, no, I haven't made a mistake. And there are so many people, including very smart people, making the same important mistake that we absolutely need to talk about this. Now, first, what is going on and how did we get here? I recently wrote about Social Security claiming strategies in the Wall Street Journal and at Kitsis.com. And wow, did that open up a can of worms? Because it turns out there's a stunning amount of confusion around how to properly choose a discount rate for evaluating when to claim Social Security. So let's fix that. And we're going to start with the very basics, because that's actually what matters for real people making real decisions about their retirement. All right, so discount rates. Why do we even care? Well, when you're trying to figure out when to claim Social Security, you're basically comparing different strategies that vary both in timing and the size of your benefits. The longer you wait to claim, the bigger your monthly check gets. So let's say you're looking at your options and you personally could get $2,100 a month if you started at age 62, or you could wait until 67 and get $3,000 a month, or you could delay all the way until age 70 and get $3,720 a month. Now, the way this works is that after your full retirement age, which in this example would be 67, your benefit increases by about 8% per year for every year you wait. And this is where I need to interrupt myself and address something that drives me crazy. I cannot tell you how many times I hear people, including financial advisors who should know better, say something like, of course it makes sense to wait. Where else can I get a guaranteed 8% return on my investment? That's not how this works. That 8% is not a rate of return. And here's why. If your benefit goes from $3,000 a month at age 67 to $3,240 a month at age 68, your monthly benefit amount went up, but initially you haven't generated any return. You had to give up $36,000 on the front end. That's the $3,000 per month for 12 months that you could have been receiving just to get that extra $240 a month starting a year from now. So the reality is you start out in a $36,000 hole and you need to dig yourself out of that hole over time with those extra $240 monthly payments. If we're just adding up dollars and completely ignoring time value money, which is already a very questionable thing to do, but bear with me, it takes about 13 and a half years before you break even. That's a break even age of about 80 and a half. Delay from 67 to 70 instead. And now you start in a $108,000 hole. And it takes about 15 and a half years to catch up. Break even age in that case would be about 82 and a half. But, and this is important, there's a glaring problem with how we're looking at this right now. We're treating a dollar at age 67 as if it's worth exactly the same as a dollar at age 82. And that's just not how money works, or time, or literally anything we're looking at here. Because obviously, a dollar today is worth more than a dollar in the future. A dollar today could be invested, or spent, or turned into tacos. Garcon, tacos please. So when we're comparing these strategies, we can't just count raw dollars. We need to account for the fact that future dollars are worth inherently less to us than present dollars. And that's where a discount rate comes in. It tells us how much we should discount those future dollars when we're trying to compare them to today's dollars. And this is where things get contentious, like surprisingly contentious. What rate should we use? Okay, so here's the most common answer you'll hear, and it's wrong, but in a really subtle way that even smart people miss. People say, well, Social Security is inflation protected and it's essentially risk-free. So obviously we should use the expected return on a similarly low risk investment, like treasury inflation protected securities or TIPS. And I get it, this feels right. It sounds super reasonable. And also it's how I was taught to think about this stuff in grad school. It's also the right answer to the wrong question. Here's what I mean. If the question we were asking was, what is the market value of a social security income stream, like 
If some hypothetical Wall Street trader wanted to price out what they would pay for your benefit, then yes, you absolutely would use a duration-matched tips yield to figure that out. That's standard asset pricing theory. But here's the thing. Most people, when they're thinking about their personal finances, don't care what some hypothetical Wall Street trader would value their Social Security income stream at. That's just not the question they're asking. You can't sell your Social Security benefit. It's not a tradable security. You can't liquidate it and move to Tahiti. I mean, you can move to Tahiti, but you can't liquidate your benefit to help you do that. The question people actually care about is, what am I giving up to receive this Social Security income stream? That's not an asset pricing question. That's an opportunity cost question. And the thing about opportunity cost, and this is really important, is that they're personal. David's opportunity cost is different from Michael's opportunity cost. Mine is different from yours. Once we shift to thinking about opportunity cost, there's no longer one universally correct answer. And this is the big mistake that keeps getting made over and over again. Smart people, economists, finance professors, big name retirement researchers will insist that the only acceptable discount rate is tips yields, but they're misapplying an asset pricing framework to an opportunity cost question. Wrong tool for the job. Okay, so if we're not just blindly using tips yields, how do we actually figure out what discount rate to use? Here's a good starting point. Look at the expected rate of return on whatever investment you would actually be spending down to fund your delay. So for instance, if someone is setting up a tips ladder, basically buying a portfolio of tips bonds, specifically to fund their social security delay, then yeah, start with tips yields. This is actually a case where tips yields would be the right answer. But when we look at how retirees actually behave in practice, that's not super common. Most people aren't setting up elaborate tips ladders. They're just spending down their regular retirement portfolio. So let's keep this simple. Let's say that retirement portfolio is a pretty standard 60-40 mix of stocks and bonds. Historically speaking, in the U.S., a 60-40 portfolio has earned an average of about 5% per year after adjusting for inflation. So let's start with that 5% number. If we're trying to project out future scenarios and see how things might actually play out, this is essentially our best guess of what will happen based on historical data. It gives us the truest sense of when something like a break-even might occur based on actual historical rates of return. And the difference between using a 0% discount rate and a 5% discount rate is not trivial. For delaying from 67 to 68, the break-even age we calculated out earlier moves from 80 and a half all the way out past 87. That's an extra seven years before you actually come out ahead from delaying. Now, a fair objection coming. A 60-40 portfolio bounces around a lot. Some years it's up 20%, other years it's down 15%. It's risky. Social security benefits, on the other hand, at least from an investment perspective, are inflation protected and essentially risk-free. So shouldn't we adjust for that? Yes, but, and this is crucial, we don't just immediately jump all the way down to tips yields and call it a day. Instead, to properly make a risk adjustment, we would use a concept called a certainty equivalent return, or a CER for short. Basically, we ask, what guaranteed return would make someone indifferent between holding a risky portfolio and holding a risk-free investment? And here's the thing. The answer to that question is personal. Let's say we have two people, Michael and David. Michael is pretty comfortable with market volatility. His certainty equivalent return might be 4.8% pretty close to that 5% expected return on his portfolio. He's nearly risk neutral for this decision. David, on the other hand, is way more risk averse. He would happily take a guaranteed 2% real return over dealing with any portfolio risk at all. And that's fine. That's perfectly acceptable. Though we probably should ask David if he's holding any risky investments in the first place, because if his preferences really are that extreme, he probably should just have everything in tips anyway. And again, that's not what we see most retirees do. But here's a technical point that matters. Could David theoretically have a certainty equivalent return even lower than current tips yields? Like, what if tips are yielding 2%, but David would accept a guaranteed 1.5% return over any risky portfolio? The answer is yes, he could. But would we use that 1.5% as his discount rate? No. When we're talking about opportunity cost, we want to compare an investment with the next best actually available alternative. If David can get 2% from tips in the real world, then 2% is what we use. 
even if he'd personally be willing to accept less. Tips yields effectively serve as a lower bound for a discount rate, at least when we're talking about only investment risk. Now, I'm going to come back to that only investment risk caveat in a second, because it's where things get really interesting. But first, what about the upper end? Is that 5% expected return on the risky portfolio the maximum certainty equivalent return we'd ever use? In this case, yes. The expected return also serves as an upper bound, but again, only for investment risk. In this example, someone with a CER of 5% is what we'd call risk neutral. They don't need any extra expected return to compensate them for taking risk. Now, some economists involved in this debate will insist that using a 5% rate is ridiculous because everyone needs to be risk averse. As a result, everyone's risk adjusted discount rate, they would say, needs to be lower than 5%. This is simply not true. It's perfectly fine to be risk neutral. Your preferences aren't wrong just because some economist thinks you should have different ones. And beyond that, just because someone is risk averse in general doesn't mean they need to be risk averse in every specific case. As economists like to say, on this margin, meaning in this particular decision, someone could be risk neutral while they might be risk averse overall. This could be especially relevant when the impact of a decision is fairly small relative to someone's overall financial situation, or at least the perceived outcomes and how it would impact them is relatively small. But here's a really important point we need to make. You may have noticed I keep emphasizing this phrase, only investment risk. That's because there's a much bigger issue at play here. If we zoom out and start considering other risks involved in the social security claiming decision, then the reasonable range of discount rates can expand way outside that narrow bound of just tips yields and the expected portfolio returns. Let me give you an example, longevity risk. One of the key benefits of delaying social security is that you get your benefit for the rest of your life, no matter how long you live. You cannot outlive this benefit. This addresses a real risk that retirees face. Now, on a technical note, I'm not sure that trying to cram all of the different risk considerations that a retiree may face into one single discount rate is even the best way to analyze this stuff. I think scenario modeling and stress testing are often better approaches, but a lot of real world tools that people will actually use may only let them input a single discount rate. So let's work within that framework. So longevity risk. Delaying helps with that. Let's go back to Michael and his 4.8% certainty equivalent return. I'm just making up numbers here to illustrate the concept, but let's say that accounting for how delaying reduces longevity risk moves his personal discount rate from 4.8% to 3.8%, a full one percentage point reduction. But here's where people make another really big mistake. It is super common for people to only talk about investment risk and longevity risk when thinking about social security claiming. They get myopically focused on these two things. And my articles that stirred up all that controversy, they were directly calling out this overly narrow focus because there are a lot of other risks that get completely ignored, like mortality risk. That's the risk you might die before you reach a break-even age where delaying pays off. Sequence of returns risk. Spending down your portfolio more heavily in your early retirement to fund your delay makes you way more vulnerable to market downturns right when you're retiring. Health span risk. This is something Bill Perkins talks about in his book, Die With Zero. It's the risk that a lot of people, particularly those who are good savers, get so focused on thinking about lifespan that they don't pay enough attention to their health span or when they'll actually have the health and ability to enjoy their money. At 62, you might be taking your grandkids on roller coasters, jumping in waves at the beach, zip lining through rainforest. At 92, not so much. And we have policy risk. There's no guarantee that Congress won't mess with future benefits. Social Security's primary trust fund is projected to be depleted by 2033. And if Congress does nothing, which, let's be honest, is very on-brand for Congress, current projections suggest we would see 23% cuts in benefits. Now, I think there are real ways to fix this, but are we really going to pretend that there's zero risk of future benefit cuts? Underspending risk is another one that's commonly overlooked. Many people who are good savers have a strong tendency to underspend relative to what they could actually afford in retirement. And empirically, we see that people are less likely to underspend guaranteed income sources, like Social Security, compared to portfolio withdrawals. So claiming earlier can help combat these tendencies. We still haven't exhausted the list of other risks. There's regret risk, there's reduced optionality. I cover these more in depth in my Kitsis article, but 
I think we've made the point we need to make here. The crucial insight is that when we look beyond just investment risk, we're dealing with what economists call a two-sided risk problem. We can't simply say that claiming early or delaying is inherently less risky because no matter what decision we make, we're increasing some risks while decreasing others. Let's go back to Michael. He started with a certainty equivalent return of 4.8%. Then we reduced his discount rate to 3.8% after accounting for longevity risk. But now let's say we also increase it by half a percentage point for each of mortality risk, sequence of returns risk, and policy risk. Now, Michael is at a personal discount rate of 5.3%, which is perfectly acceptable once we opened up the discussion to more than just investment risk. It could be even significantly higher, since there are still other risks we haven't fully accounted for. And on the flip side, for someone who isn't particularly prone to some of these risks, then the reasonable discount rate could even end up below tips yields. It's all individual. It's all custom. So don't fall for the trap of thinking that tips yields are the only acceptable discount rate. That mistake is everywhere. It's all over the internet, and it's not just random people who don't know what they're talking about. You'll find financial advisors repeating this. You'll find Harvard-trained economists repeating this. You'll find some of the biggest names in retirement research repeating this. And it's just flat out wrong. They're using an asset pricing framework for an opportunity cost question. Okay, so how do we actually make any of this practical? Here's what I think is a really reasonable starting point. Just look at the expected rate of return on whatever asset you're actually going to be spending down to delay claiming. If you've specifically set up a tips ladder to fund your delay, great, use tips yields. If you're more like most people and you're just going to spend down some diversified retirement portfolio, great, use the inflation-adjusted expected rate of return on that portfolio. And I say I think that's a good starting point because I think often that's where things end up about anyways because of this two-sided nature of the risks involved with delaying. Now, maybe somebody's situation is unique and they're particularly prone or not prone to certain risks, and the math is going to shake out different. Fine, please adjust accordingly. But the expected rate of return on an asset that's actually being displaced is a solid first approximation for most people. This approach also has the advantage of being the most realistic for analyzing outcomes people might actually experience. Because here's the thing about risk-adjusted returns. You never actually experience risk-adjusted returns. In real life, you experience actual returns with all their ups and downs. So that's what makes me comfortable using the expected return of a portfolio that otherwise would be spent down as a starting point. And contrary to what you may have heard elsewhere, from Reddit, from academic papers, from people with fancier credentials than mine, that's not wrong. In fact, it's the people who are insisting that tips yields are the only acceptable discount rate who are making the error. They're applying an asset pricing framework to a personal opportunity cost question. Wrong tool, wrong question. All right, I think that's it for today. I hope you found this helpful. Let me know in the comments what discount rate you think we should use, because apparently we need to have this conversation. Thanks for watching.